Uh, good morning. So I'm going to tell you a true story about JavaScript and performance. Uh, JavaScript, anybody heard of JavaScript? It turns out it's the world's most popular programming language. It's an amalgam of features from several other languages. Uh, from Java, it gets lousy syntax. Uh, from Scheme, it gets functions as first-class objects, the best idea in the history of programming languages. And from Self, it gets prototypal inheritance, which is the other greatest idea. And being, having that combination, uh, prototypes and first-class objects, gives it a, an enormous expressive power. It's brilliant. But historically, it's been really slow. Um, early implementations were optimized for time to market. And that was 15 years ago. Um, and they were heavily patched for, for bug fixes since then, because there were a lot of bugs and a lot of patches. So they've just been getting slower and slower. Now, despite that, JavaScript has become a hugely popular language anyway, despite its lack of performance. But that's changed. We now have frenzied competition. All of the browser makers, all the JavaScript engine makers, are in a fevered battle to try to have the fastest JavaScript engine. So this started with Google's V8, and all the others have copied now. So they're all trying to be the fastest, which is great. Uh, now, JavaScript is a load and go system. It means that JavaScript programs are delivered to the execution site as source code, as text. And they are then compiled and executed at the site. This is different than in most other languages where you distribute some kind of executable form. This was done to facilitate the embedding of JavaScript into HTML, which is something uh, Souders discovered is actually a bad idea. What we want to do instead is put the JavaScript into separate files so that it can be minified, compressed, and cached. That significantly improves the performance of page loading. Um, and the other thing that's bad about being able to uh, embed JavaScript in HTML is that becomes the vector for XSS injection, which is the biggest security hazard in browsers. Um, so because it's a load and go system, there is no time for optimizing. Optimizing compilers can do wonderful things in making code go faster, but they can take many minutes to do that work. And we don't have time for that on the web. The web wants to start up immediately. Um, JavaScript does not specify an executable format or a virtual machine. It only specifies a text format for delivering behavior to uh, browsers and other uh, execution sites. So there's a trade-off between offline optimization and portability. And the web chose portability, because portability is the web's most important feature. The portability is the single best thing that the web has over all other application delivery systems. So I'd like to stop here <clears throat> for a brief interlude. Um, anybody remember Java? Anybody? A couple, couple hands, some of the old timers maybe. Um, Java was um, sort of a dialect of C++. It left out pointers, but basically it was the, the same idea. Uh, some people think because of the name Java and JavaScript, they're so similar that Java had something to do with JavaScript, and that turns out not to be the case. Um, JavaScript, Java, you know, for example, doesn't have functions as first-class objects, doesn't have prototypes, and there's really not much there. Um, Java was supposed to be uh, the world's biggest programming language. Java applets were to rule the, rule the world in the late 20th century. Um, instead, were the biggest failure in the history of software development. <laughs> it's another old-timer there. Um, so why did it fail? Um, it had um, a, a failed security model. Like most security models, it frustrated useful things and allowed dangerous things. Uh, there was a lack of portability, so the write once, run everywhere promise was not kept. It had one of the worst UI toolkits ever imagined. Um, but maybe the biggest problem was horrendous um, startup times. It used a process called class loading which would load each of the components of the program as they were needed. Um, and the security requirements of class loading made it slower than compiling the original program. So the idea of compiling something and then having the executable um, that that could load faster turned out not to be the case. Now, it turns out none of these problems are problems in a server environment. So Java is finding some success on the servers. So that's great. Uh, so that's the end of the interlude. Now we'll go back to my talk. Um, so there does not exist an executable format which is secure, highly optimizable, and portable. 
so um, that's sort of the situation that we find ourselves in with JavaScript. Um, so instead, what we're forced to do is optimize as we go. That we start by interpreting, and as we're interpreting, the um, system is aware of what the interpreter is doing and then tries to generate code as it discovers that that code would be useful. This is a style of, of execution that was developed for the self language. That's the same self language that gave us prototypes. It's been teaching the world how to make language processors go faster. It's now being applied to JavaScript, which is pretty natural since JavaScript inherited a lot of its smartness from self. And we're seeing some really good results there. Um, so how fast are the new engines that take advantage of this stuff? Well, it's complicated. Um, there is no single number which answers the question, how fast is a language processor? It depends on what the programs are doing. And every program could have a different mix of features which will exploit some particular benefits that an engine provides, but hit on other uh, slow spots that it has. And so having an accurate answer to the question, what's the fastest JavaScript engine, we, we really don't know and, and may never know. Um, so the best we can do is come up with benchmarks. And there's a problem with benchmarks. Um, benchmarks tend to be written by people who don't understand or use the language, um, who are motivated more by the need to make the processors go faster uh, without really considering the needs of the people who use the language or the programs that are written in those languages. So benchmarks tend to promote patterns that the engine implementers want to implement. And it makes sense because you shouldn't try to put optimizations into a system without having some way to measure it. And the way they measure it is with benchmarks. Um, and they, uh, benchmarks tend to promote patterns that resemble benchmarks. There was a, uh, Ben Zorn was at this conference a year ago where he talked about uh, JS Meter, which is some brilliant work being done at, at uh, Microsoft Research, where they determined that all of the common benchmarks used for measuring JavaScript performance have no correlation with real applications. Despite that, all the engine makers are continuing to tune to the benchmarks because they don't know what else to do. Um, you can't optimize without numbers, and benchmarks provide the only numbers that they've got. They really don't know what else to do. Um, now, we contrast that with life on the web. Um, web developers have a difficult time with the browser. Uh, they desire to make applications that are highly responsive, but in many ways, the browser is a black box. That's less true now. At, at this conference, some excellent tools for breaking open the black box are, are available but um, most web developers are not using those yet. So they desire to produce applications that are highly responsive, but they don't know how to do it. And the browser platform contains some deep inefficiencies. And if you run against those inefficiencies, uh, your applications will be seriously degraded. And there's little visibility inside the black box as to what's causing that degradation. Um, the, the biggest problem in the browser in terms of performance is the DOM. The DOM is a bottleneck. Um, if JavaScript engines were infinitely fast, most web applications would run at about the same speed because it's not the JavaScript engine which is the limiter there, it's the DOM. Browsers spend most of their time doing layout, painting, marshalling, styling, I.O., and all the other stuff that they do. Um, so the benefit of faster JavaScript engines isn't to improve current applications, it's to enable whole new classes of applications, and that's exciting and good. Um, so out of frustration, many developers are dedicated to optimizing their JavaScript code even though it is not effective. So why would they spend time trying to do optimizations which are not effective? Let's stop for another in interlude here. So I'm going to tell the story of the drunk and the lamppost. There's a drunk on his hands and knees under a lamppost, and he's looking for something, and someone walks up and says, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm looking for my keys. I dropped them over there. And he points into a dark corner in the alley. And he's asked, well, why are you looking over here? And he said, because the light's better. So that's the end of the interlude. <laughs> so Donald Knuth of Stanford University, the author of The Art of Computer Programming, said that premature optimization is the root of all evil, and he is absolutely right. Uh, but despite that, web developers feel compelled to prematurely optimize anyway. Um, they believe that they must optimize prematurely because they will not be given a chance to do so later. 
that given the way agile tends to be managed, once an inefficiency is put into code, it's going to be locked in forever. Um, so the, a popular scheme for doing that is they will choose between two language features by putting each in a loop and running it a thousand times, and they will always pick the winner. And they will always pick the winner even if the differences are not significant, even if the race is likely to go the other way in future versions, and even if the result is code that is more difficult to read or maintain. So they will actually work against the interests of code quality, um, thinking that they're making things more performant when in fact they're not. They are trying to do the right thing, and they think themselves being responsible and heroic. Um, it's just not working out very well. So we, we see two patterns here which are interacting badly together. Um, we're seeing uh, benchmarks, which are not representative of good applications, which are driving engine performance. And then we're having engine performance driving programming style. And this is having the consequence of discouraging good programming practices. Um, so uh, one more interlude. So who am I to say what are good coding practices? I'll tell you who I am. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm the author of the best-selling pamphlet, JavaScript, The Good Parts. <laughs> I am the guy who discovered jo that JavaScript has good parts. <laughs> this was the first important discovery of the 21st century. <laughs> and when I made this discovery, nobody else believed it. It took a long time to actually confirm uh, that my discoveries were true, that JavaScript contains some of the best parts ever put into programming languages. So since then, I've been developing programming patterns that make use of the good parts while avoiding the bad parts, trying to uh, you know, struggle to, to learn how to use this language in its most effective way. And to help me in doing that, I created a code quality tool called JSLint to help developers use the good parts more effectively. JSLint reads your program and advises you on, on how you can make it better. So on with the show. So I'm concerned that the benchmarks are having the un unintended consequence of worsening the language and its usage. Um, and that would be a shame. We're just now figuring out how to use the language well, but this interaction between performance um, is, is getting in the way. So the, the fundamental problem, I think, is that the benchmarks do not reflect the characteristics of good programs. So um, I designed a new benchmark. And the benchmark was JS Lint being run on itself, measuring the amount of time it took just to do the Java, JavaScript processing. It demonstrates a, a real application behaviors that are not exercised in other benchmarks, especially prototypal and functional patterns in the context of a large, complicated program. Uh, most web programs do not look like a loop doing one little thing a thousand times. This is a test only of JavaScript performance. It does not measure any of the other aspects of browser performance. So the numbers I'm about to show you do not tell you which is the fastest browser, because it's only measuring one component of browser performance, in most cases, the least significant component of browser performance. And it's not also a complete measure of, of JavaScript engine performance, because again, it's very complicated. But it is a measure of performance for one style of programming, a style of programming that I recommend. And it had some really nice consequences. Um, so here are the results. This is what I got from running JavaScript on itself. The most surprising result was that um, Chrome had the worst performance. It was um, a, a, a factor of three compared to um, Safari, a factor of five compared to IE10 preview. Completely unexpected result. Had, I, was not prepared for that. Given the reputation of the people doing the V8 uh, work, I expected it would be the fastest. And it was the slowest. And it was the slowest because their benchmarks did not include the patterns that were being exercised in JSLint, patterns which are common to well-written programs. Uh, they took that as a challenge. And in about two weeks, they issued the uh, Chrome 13 uh, Canary uh, preview. And it is now the fastest. So I, in uh, about two weeks, I got a factor of five improvement out of V8, which is amazing. Um, 
and all it took was giving them a good target to shoot at, and being brilliant guys, they hit it, and they're now performing slightly better than IE 10 preview. Um, since then, um, all of the browsers have, have revved their engines, and, and they're all getting much closer uh, to the same number. So generally, um, asking the question which JavaScript engine is the fastest, I think is meaningless, and it's a pointless question, but because of benchmarks like this, they are all getting much, much better. So that's my story for you. Thank you, and good night.